Have you ever felt like your birth experiences left you with more questions than answers? In this raw and honest episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, we sit down with Samantha, a mom whose births took unexpected and sometimes frightening turns. Samantha vulnerably shares her journey through a postpartum hemorrhage, blood clot, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and an extremely premature birth at 26 weeks. Her stories will make you wonder. How do you heal and find support when your births deviate so far from what you envisioned? Join us as we explore the difficult emotions and incredible strength that come with facing the unknown in birth and motherhood. Samantha's experiences highlight the importance of advocating for yourself, seeking help when needed, and honoring the unique path of your journey. Tune in to discover how to navigate the challenges and find beauty on the other side. The Golden Hour Birth Podcast, a podcast about real birth stories and creating connections through our shared experiences. Childbirth isn't just about the child. It's about the person who gave birth, their lives, their wisdom, and their empowerment. We're Liz and Natalie, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, and we're here to laugh with you, cry with you, and hold space for you. Welcome to the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. I am your co-host, Liz. And I'm your co-host, Natalie. And tonight we have Samantha from Indiana on. She is a mom of two, seven, and four. Um, Well, two, ages seven and four. <laughs> and we're, we're so grateful to have you on tonight, Samantha. It's great to know Thanks you. Thanks for having me. It's nice to meet you guys. Thank you. You too. Um, so if you want to go ahead and start us off and tell us a little bit about you and your family. Yeah, um, so Samantha, um, my husband's Greg. We uh, met at work maybe 10, 11 years ago, somewhere in there where he'll lose track of time. So, um, but we we met and after a short stint of hating his work ethic and we started dating and um, then he, over one Christmas, just uh, moved into my house and didn't leave. Most people would kick them out after that, but I was like, all right, I kind of like you. You can stay. So, um, and then maybe two years after that, we were married um, and had our son Liam, who is seven. And then, um, and then our daughter Sophie's four. And they, they are obviously beautiful and perfect and amazing now and when they want to be. But um, yeah, I'm just, you know, you look at us with mom, dad, boy, girl, perfect, complete family. And that's, that's the end of our childbearing years. So it's been, it's been nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, um, my husband would probably have to agree with you. Boy, girl, let's be done. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> there were these times where I definitely wanted so, like four or five. And then I think after she was potty trained. I'm like, that's it. Thank you for that. Um, no more. So. Yeah. Yeah. More yeah. Diapers. If it would have happened before <laughs> she was on a diaper, that would have been a possibility. But afterwards, no. So. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. definitely nice. <laughs> um. So what has pregnancy number one been like? Um. So pregnancy with Liam was um completely a surprise. He was definitely not a planned baby. I had finally become a responsible adult and was like, I should probably make my very first OBGYN appointment at the ripe age of 22 um, and figure out what that means for me. And, you know, did all of that. And they were like, uh, you have PCOS. I would be surprised at the severity of what it sounds like that you would ever have children. If you do, probably would need some type of medical intervention cue meltdown of you know failure as a wife and mother and all of that and um apparently at that time of all those tests i was pregnant but it was too early so it's apparently in very 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 early pregnancy that's what it mirrors so um i they'd started me on medication and i found out that i was pregnant with him at like nine weeks pregnant so I missed a good chunk of that, um, which I can't say if, if maybe I had been a little bit, probably less in denial. I mean, I was sick all day, every day, every smell. I worked in a bakery at the time. Every smell that I once enjoyed made me hurl. 
I had my very own personal hurling trash can that went with me on wheels throughout the bakery. So um, I should have known my coworkers were like, you are. I'm like, it's the medicine. A side effect is nausea. So yeah, nine weeks later, I was like, I should probably check that. And it did. And then um, called my doctor's office, who I'd seen one time. And they were like, oh, great. Then we'll see you um, next week for an ultrasound. For a what? So, um, <laughs> yeah, so that was fine now. Then trying to figure out how to tell my husband, um, by the way, uh, <laughs> we're like already uh, a fourth of the way through this thing. So good luck with adjusting to that. So um, he adjusted as every man <laughs> did in complete silence for a while while he thought about it. So, um, but yeah, so pregnancy with him aside from 28 weeks of severe nausea and you know just in general never wanting to leave the couch um was perfect normal he was measuring really far ahead because his family has all like 10 pound plus babies so i wasn't looking forward to that um and i was scheduled to be induced like 39 weeks six days because my doctor was going on vacation and liam did not seem to want to be evicted anytime soon but everything is picture perfect. And then um, my water broke day before my scheduled induction and went in for, you know, all that. My doctor's like, you just couldn't wait one more day. You know, babies do what they do. So we uh, went in. We, the doctor I chose only went to this hospital like 45 minutes away from our house. And at my previous appointment, I was already like five centimeters dilated. So we thought this was going to be like a rush. Well, the lie now, your water breaking doesn't mean that you have contractions because, you know, that doesn't happen together, apparently. So um, I hung out for like eight hours. They had me walk and do everything, but I never started contractions. So then, then we had to start the whole induction process anyway. And eight wonderful hours later and two hours of pushing that I didn't. No one explains that in movies either, you know, but, you know, babies just don't just pop right out. So I should have done a lot more research during that perfect pregnancy. Um, but two hours of pushing uh, because he had, I don't even remember what his head circumference was now because I try to block that from my memory, but his head was just stuck on my pelvic bone. And finally he came out eight pounds, 12 ounces, nice, healthy, perfect little man. Um, all the, you know, perfect, you know, skin to skin that you could ask for. Um, birth itself, I I always will say this, like, I have been through worse things. And those are upcoming, but I've been through worse things. And it, it was not as bad, no drugs, than I thought it would be. So it was after I had him. So he's on my chest, we're snuggling, and I'm like, I have to push again. I don't know what you guys did, but I have to push again. And they're like, and my doctor's already gone home because it's 2 a.m. So she's stitched me up and she's she's out. So um, um, the nurse is like, like your placenta is yep, delivered, I am right? stitched up. I've been to the bathroom. I am. Yeah, I'm laying there with my baby trying to nurse for the first time. They're like, it's just contractions because you're nursing. Okay, I don't know what that means, but that's not what this is. And so they kept coming over doing fundal massages and checking me and I wasn't bleeding any extra and I I luckily had the greatest nurse ever and she was like I've been with you all day and I you I believe you something's wrong so you know they're doing all these sorts of exams and nothing's wrong I'm perfect like something's wrong so finally I'm in enough pain that I'm like in the fetal position and I can't move. They took the baby. They took the baby to the nursery because, of course, my husband's like, I'm hungry and tired and I need a nap. And so baby goes to nursery. I'm trying to figure out how to not die. And they're not giving me anything for pain. Obviously, you just had a baby. And I'm like, I just had a baby without pain meds. And now I'm asking for pain meds. So somebody give me something. So they finally call my doctor and they approve med morphine. They give me that. Apparently, I'm allergic to morphine. Never had it in my life. So. Now we've got all the, you know, Benadryl and everything trying to stop that. And um, finally, um, let's see. 
He was born at 12. About 4 a.m., my doctor comes back in because the nurses are like, I don't know what's wrong. And um, she walks in. I explain to her and she's like, okay, has anybody done a rectal exam? And I'm just like, why do you got to do that for? Like, what is that? That's not where babies come from. And she walks over and she's like, just trust me. So she, I, I think, was maybe did a 30 second exam and was like, OK, um, in the world's calmest voice. And she was just such a level headed person in a room full of chaos. And it's like, I'm going to need you to call up, have the OR prepped, um, get this nurse and this nurse. And they know what I'll need to set up for the minute I get in there. Start getting him consent papers, and then we'll be- begin. And so she comes over, because I'm still curled up in the fetal position, gets in my face, and is like, okay, I know what's wrong with you. And she tried to explain it. Again, at this point, I have no idea what's going on. Just make it stop. And she, I, that's all I really cared about at that point. And so I said, I will do whatever you need me to do. I will. And my logic was, I will have five more babies for you if you just make this stop. How that was going to help anything, I don't know. but. That was my rationale there. And she said, I will make it stop. So we went to the OR. I woke up at about eight and I felt perfectly fine. I was hungry. They're handing me a baby. I still can't feel my arms, but they're handing me a baby telling me he's hungry. And then around eight o'clock, all the doctors and stuff came in and everybody's in my room. And I don't know any of these people. It's none of them my doctor. So my doctor finally came in later, but I was the most popular person ever because they had delivered a nearly nine pound blood clot out of my body. Um, apparently, during all the pushing, he tore, um, she said it was about a half a centimeter outside of my cervix. If it had been in my cervix or in my uterus, I would have had to have a complete hysterectomy. Um, and she's only had that happen one other time in her career. And but one centimeter outside, he tore a gash in in the canal and it had done what bodies are supposed to do and clotted because he had pressed on it for so long while he was in there and it was able to clot but i was bleeding into the clot so it expanded and expanded so apparently every doctor had received you know a memo with a picture of this giant blood clot and i was just so popular because it was bigger than my baby so yeah. So she was like, if I um, I hadn't come in when I did and I came maybe just 30 minutes later, you would be dead because we would have cut open that and you would have lost all your blood. And I go, okay, well, that was fun. So what do we do now? She goes, nothing. You're perfect. I stitched you up. I gave you your entire blood volume back and you're good to go. And I was. Oh, my so, God. Oh my yeah. God. Do you have pick? No, no. Uh, she asked if I wanted any, and I hardcore did not. Um, yeah, I was just Hi. like, can we erase wow. that whole night? Because, I mean, again, labor delivery, perfect, and then that. And, yeah, so we were in there for a couple days. Um, you know, he was normal baby things, jaundice, you know, all of this stuff. And then we left, and I had the world's so- most perfect postpartum picture after that. So, like with him in in the uterus, he was somehow clotting. Yes. So the clot, his head had torn it because essentially I, I worked on getting his stupid head out for over an hour and a half. So in the process of repeatedly mm-hmm. tearing in the same spot, his head was still managing to compress it enough that it never fully like tore to the point that i had like an open wound it was mm-hmm. torn inside of itself like i don't really know how to explain it uh, like i didn't have an open wound like on surface level but there was an open wound within the muscle so in that wow. it just continued to balloon and balloon and everybody doing a, a vaginal exam wasn't feeling anything because the blood was expanding yeah. backward back oh so, wow so when they took you to the or did they go in yes vaginally? they went in vaginally and essentially she went up to that spot i don't remember exactly how she i think she had someone do a rectal exam and essentially like poke 
to where she could feel it on the other side. And then she mm-hmm. cut in that spot and then spent, I think she said, like in the next 45 minutes, just draining the blood while they were replacing blood and getting me to clot oh. and getting all that medicine in me. And then she was able to, I think, cauterize it, stitch me. And while she was in there, just for good measure, just because we already had enough surprises, she did a DNC, scraped everything out just to make sure that everything was good to go. So, wow, yeah, it was. And I mean, I don't I didn't have any extra How? pain from having stitches from way up there from having any of that. I mean, I woke up and I felt perfect. So. Pregnant. You were 23, 23. Two? I just turned. I was a week after my 23rd birthday. Wow. Yeah. And my mom and his mom were there after I after I had him. Again, it's midnight. They came in after we did skin to skin. It was about like one. And I mean, I was like shaking. I thought that it was just, you know, the afterbirth shakes that you get and stuff. But it was apparently because of the blood loss. So they, you know, my, my mom had said something. She's, like, She's shaking a lot. And they're like, oh, that's completely normal. It's not. Mom had stayed. Things probably would have been caught. And fixed a lot sooner. But um, they said hi, bye, left, went home. And my husband, I'm not sure he was invited to family gatherings for like us all like two months after my son was born because my mom was so mad at him because he didn't call anybody. I went into the OR and he went, he went to bed. And like, I don't think he was processing anything. He was signing papers, but, you know, we had been awake since i mean we got like a full night of sleep but it was i don't know 6 a.m and now when i went back to the or it was 4 a.m and it was just a long full day and he just he signed the paperwork that said they could take my uterus the life-saving measures all of those things and then passed out on the most uncomfortable couch of his life like it was no big deal so <laughs> yeah it was, uh, like, well, I'm glad you had a good nap. I had a good nap too from like four to seven. It was great. I woke up feeling perfectly refreshed. Um, then, then <laughs> handing me my baby. I'm like, I had a baby? Like, what, what day is that? So then trying to figure all that out. And, you know, he had been, uh, he had managed to, you know, nurse one time. But other than that, they were just sitting in the nursery giving him sugar water. Like, I appreciate that, but I would have totally been okay if somebody just fed my baby, you know? So things you learn and prepare for the next time that hopefully would never happen again. Um, mm-hmm. But my, my next doctor was fully prepared for that. I, I did switch doctors in between um, Liam and Sophie because um, I had an ectopic pregnancy in between them. And... My doctor, who mm. saved me after Liam, lover to bits and pieces, uh, was going through a lot of personal things in her life. And I think it's a problem that I know about the personal things in her life, number one. Number two, the, those things allowed her to miss that it wasn't just a miscarriage and that it was a tubal. And my tube ruptured. I would have been roughly 11 weeks. So somehow it managed to go to 11 weeks. Before rupturing, so I have some really elastic tubes. Yeah. Um, but that ruptured, and um, I nearly died again. So, um, I called my mom that time because my husband was at work. He was he about an hour and forty five minutes away. And I called her, and Liam, Liam was almost two. I think he was almost two. And so he's sleeping. It's like four in the morning. I'm like something is wrong. I had went to bed with a cough. I had taken some NyQuil. It is two weeks before Christmas. And I woke up when my husband left to kiss me goodbye. And I was like, oh, hey. And I had just thought that I had a miscarriage, you know, uh, what, six, four to six weeks ago, somewhere in that range. And Thought maybe I was getting my first period back and life was going to be normal again. And then 
what was period cramps quickly was like, okay, something's really not right. And at, at one point I had gone downstairs because our, everybody, every house has, I think like a puke bowl or bucket or something. I'd gone downstairs to get that because I was like, I, I'm going to get sick. And after you have kids, you know, sometimes you need to be on the toilet at the same time. So they needed the bucket. Uh, no. And um, I don't remember. I remember waking up on the floor of my kitchen and I'm like, okay, yeah, no, something's really not right. But still, I'm not going to call 911. I'm going to call my mom. I called my mom. And she came over about like 30 minutes later when I had passed out on the way down, back down the stairs trying to, because I went upstairs to try and pack a bag. You know, I got to get stuff ready for my kid if I'm going to be going somewhere. So um, I had come downstairs because she was like, I need you to come unlock the door. Okay. So she found me on the floor, called 911. You know, they're like, what did she take? What did she take? She didn't take anything. She woke up in pain. And, you know, like she knew I was sick and she had called Greg, you know, told him I had taken NyQuil before I went to bed. So now I'm just an OD. They have no other concerns in the world. I am just an OD. So they managed to, you know, get me in the stretcher, get me in the ambulance, send me to the ER um, and the hospital that's by me is not the hospital that that doctor, that my doctor would have been at. Um, And, you know, like, She's telling him, you know, she had a miscarriage, you know, she hasn't had a period yet, blah, 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 blah. They don't care about that. They're just, you know, doing a whole bunch of stuff. My HCG pregnancy test came back negative. They have no worries with that. So we got there around 5 and finally around 11. And I remember, I had no idea what he looked like at the time, but an OBGYN coming in and saying, this is an ectopic pregnancy that has ruptured and she needs to be in the OR. You guys are going to kill her. And um, at this point, my mom had taken Liam home to nap because they were just telling her that I must have had some kind of stomach issue. I'd already had my gallbladder out, so it couldn't have been that. But um, they, uh, my mother-in-law had been called and she was just like, I have a feeling I need to come. So she got there right as I was getting rushed to the OR. So now she's signing all the paperwork. They're cutting all my clothes off and getting me in there. And again, like, replace all my blood and if I hadn't been in there right then would have died so that guy became my doctor then this is just a theme now if you do surgery on me you're my doctor so um mm-hmm. but he was um a maternal fetal medicine specialist so he was great just luck of the draw that he was there and um he was really uh, detailed I do have pictures I'd have to find them of the tubal and everything he was like it was about this big of what I took out of you. And um, that was after part of it had already ruptured and broken off when he got in there. So missing one tube, he was able to leave my ovary. So still had everything working and, um, you know, went through, scraped everything out and then sent me on my way. Now that, that recovery was no joke. I will say that that one was no fun, but... At that point, I don't know. I, I didn't really process everything. It's just, okay, so when can we try to have another baby? Because, like, before they were saying it was only, like, six more weeks. And now what's the goal here? And um, uh, let's see. He said we could start trying to get in March. But that he wouldn't advise it. When do we listen to doctors, though? So March came around and we started trying for Sophie. First planned baby. That's not as much fun as it is to just find out surprisingly. But it was still, at this point, now we're being told, you know, ah, they're stacked against you because you've only got the one tube. So essentially, every other cycle, it's not going to matter what you do. So, um, and obviously, like, he could tell which cycle would be the next one based on what that was from. So I knew that this first cycle would mean nothing because I didn't have a tube there. So, um was just going through trying to track everything and all of that since I now know it's going to be harder. And April comes around and we're pregnant. Uh, so I ovulated from the side with no tube. And it traveled and was caught by my other fallopian tube. Because science is cool. 
<laughs> so uh, Sophie's my miracle baby in more ways than one. So finding out I was pregnant with her, um, I wasn't supposed to start for like another, I don't know, like week. And I was, I just, I went to bed and I'm like, I don't, I feel like I'm going to get sick. I only get sick when I'm pregnant. <laughs> so in the morning came around, I tested, it was negative. I'm like, well, it's dumb. All right, fine. Later that day, my sister tells me she was pregnant. I'm like, maybe, maybe I just like had it because I knew you were pregnant. And um, she's like, no, I bet you are too. I'm like, I don't think so. It came back negative. Like if I have symptoms, they say you should be able to test positive. But, like three days later, I'm just full blown sick. I'm like, okay, try again. And I was pregnant and our two dates were three days apart. So it was, oh, it was magical good. and perfect. And, um, my pregnancy with her, I wasn't as sick. I could survive. They have better medicine available, and I gladly took it. Um, and with her, I did have, I don't even remember, I can't remember saying right, symphysis pubis disorder. Essentially, you know, my hips mm -hmm. spread way too early. So she was sitting way low, way early, and it just felt like she was going to fall out all the time, essentially. And my my doctor being, you know, the specialist was always unavailable when you know i went in for appointments because he was doing surgeries and delivering babies so i would always just get to see the nurse practitioner who i didn't really care for and i'm telling her you know something's not right something's not right like it feels like she is going to fall out of me and i was 25 weeks like four days or something at this appointment that i had and like, I can barely walk. It literally feels like she is just hanging out. Like, I have to walk with my legs all bowed. Like, I just can't do it anymore. I either need to be put on bed rest or something. I can't, I can't move anymore. And she was like, you know, it's just because of this. You need to keep going back to physical therapy. It'll be fine. Okay. And then three days later, my water broke at 26 weeks with Sophie. And again, now I know that you don't immediately have contraction. However, I'm also not supposed to have a baby for another 14 weeks. So cue freak out. 6 a.m. My toddler's awake. I am walking around the house with a towel between my legs that I have to keep replacing every five seconds. And I called my, my mom. She was already at work. There was uh, no coming to get me at that point. My husband is already at work. Luckily, my mother-in-law came and got us and took us to the hospital and stuff because I don't think it was a, I couldn't drive. It was, I probably a shouldn't drive. Like, I don't know. I mean, the hospital's only like eight minutes down the road, but just the nerves, the shaking, the nervous, I, you know, everything and being responsible for my kid in the backseat probably wasn't a good idea. So she drove about 80 miles an hour all the way there. We made it there in about, about five minutes. It was terrifying. Um, never trust her driving before and then definitely didn't after that. So <laughs> we got there and, they, you know, they already knew we were coming, came up. And again, they're like, you know, it could just not be your water. You could be peeing your pants. Like, no, I don't think so. I've done this before, remember? So I know what this is. And, um, so, yeah, of course it was my water, but this hospital only had a level uh what two NICU or something like that and they were like for a micro preemie you need to go up here so that hospital's an hour away from my house so my mother-in-law takes my son my husband's coming back and then he's gonna meet us up there and they're like and that's where you'll be until you have the baby I'm like what do you mean until I have the baby like once your water breaks don't you have a baby so I had no idea that that was how that worked I just thought that she was gonna be born so um, I didn't have contractions right away, um, but they took me in the ambulance there, which riding in the back of an ambulance is no, no fun. I, I preferred last time when I was unconscious, that wasn't an option this time, apparently. So, um, uncomfortable, we got up there. My husband has my phone. I am just like, here, how do I tell you where I'm at? Like, you don't even know where you're going. So that like three hours, because they told him to go home, 
shower or pack me a bag. No one told me that they told him that. So I'm trying to figure out where the heck my husband is. How do I get a hold of my kid? Like, what is going on? And um, so I'm finally settled in. I've met all the doctors, all the nurses. And, um, you know, they've gone through and gotten detailed history from my doctor. And um, I think at that point, I was four centimeters dilated. So, you know, at that point, they're like, you'll hang out for as long as you can. Um, the more you drink, the more she pees and the more amniotic fluid you have, but you're just going to keep leaking. Like, that's not cool. You can't just like stow that back up there or something. And they, they don't do that. So, um, I was there for 12 days. 14 days, 14, I don't know, 27 weeks, six days, I went into labor. I just woke up one morning. I had normal 8 a.m. monitoring and um, there's not a lot to do, you know, in a hospital room by yourself with the family an hour away. So most of the time I just sat there and watched TV. So I was sitting in the bed waiting for her to come in to strap the thing to my belly, not that they could ever get anything measured on her anyway because I had no fluid and she was all the way descended down as possibly far as she could get so they were essentially measuring her kicks and that was about all they could get but it made them happy so um but yeah I was just like and I hadn't ever had early contractions before because with Liam by the time all the pitocin and stuff kicked in it was 100% you are in full labor and pain and so I was like is this is that it I think that's it. She's like, if you have to question it, like, at all, it's probably it. So I spent like an hour trying to figure out, do I call my husband? What do we do? And she's like, you're having a really tiny baby. That baby's going to fly out of there. Like, you need to be prepared. So all them, um, you know, because of flu season and all of that. We weren't allowed to have, you know, anybody else in the room, just the two of us. So because this was right before COVID. Um, so 20 October 2019. So she um, should have come right out by the time, you know, I started contracting. I was already at a seven. Life's good. It's like 9 a.m. They're expecting I'm going to have a baby by 10. My doctor is camped outside my room. She is reading a book on postpartum hemorrhaging. She's got um, a whole, like, library of books about everything that's ever happened in my chart. And she is preparing. And I'm like, well, I, I feel safe. So that's good. Um, yeah. Okay. So they I had, I can't remember what they called it. They had some type of emergency hemorrhage cart or something outside the room, too. So that way, if anything were to happen, it's already right there. Um, and, yeah, so we, you know. I I was in labor. It was far more painful this time somehow with a um, two pound baby versus an eight pound baby. So it makes sense of that for me, um, except for the fact that apparently at one point in this home, you know, being in there and having no room and no, uh, you know, liquid to cozy around in, she turned sunny side up and her whole face was caught on the bottom of my pelvic bone. So she couldn't oh, come no. out. But because she wasn't giant she didn't tear anything which is great news um but it did take let's see so my my contraction started around eight and she was born at 8 27 p.m so 12 hours to deliver a baby that big the, uh, i was only in technical labor with my son for eight hours i don't think that's fair it's not fair but she didn't try to kill me afterwards, so I'm going to give her bonus points for that one. So um, she came out. She tried to she tried to cry, but um, her face was all purple and stuff from being caught on my pelvic bone. And I went, so let's see. I, w- I was at a seven. I finally begged for the epidural. And my doctor was like, all right, you can have it. You've been at a seven for around nine hours now i think it's okay for you to have that and they're doing one now i'll come back i'm gonna go deliver another baby okay she walks out of the room um my nurse has me roll over and all of a sudden i felt and i was prepared for the worst you know having a tiny baby something's gonna happen right and, um i felt a literal click 
in my pelvis, which is apparently her bone, her facial bone coming dislodged from my bone and her descending completely the rest of the way down the birth canal in one go, in one just whoosh, because she didn't need 10 centimeters to come out because she was not 10 centimeters. So um, she kind of swooped down there. Um, my nurse, I was like, something's wrong. Like her cord fell out. Something is hanging out of my body. And the nurse like, let's think. She's like, don't do anything. Whatever you do, do not do anything. And now I'm panicking even more because that's all she's saying. She's just tapping the thing on her, her vocera, like call, call, call. And so she finally gets the doctor, the entire team, the NICU team comes running down the hallway. And I am I was told not to do anything. I was told not to push. My doctor comes in there and she's like, okay, I need you to push. I'm like, but there's something wrong. She's like, no, your baby's arm's hanging out. Your baby's ready to come out. I'm like, she, I'm ready for you now. She didn't want to deliver your baby without a, a NICU team in here. Your baby's good until it enters this world and then it needs help. Okay. So I opened my legs and that baby flew out of my body. There was There was no pushing required. She flew. And bed wasn't broken down. Nothing was set up. They grabbed her, put her on my chest for a second, but she needed help. They took her and put her in the bed and everything. But I'm just looking at her. I'm like, what is wrong with her? Greg, go over there. What is wrong with her? Her head was black and I did not know what was going on. It was a giant head full of black hair, jet black, thick hair. Oh my God. You scared, I scared me. me. Nobody was telling me anything. And I'm like, her head is black, Greg. It is black and careful. Like, what is going on? And they're not telling you anything because they're trying to get her intubated and stuff. They're busy. I get it. But communication would be cool. Um, air reference my son has platinum blonde hair. It is so white that <laughs> you couldn't even call it yellow in any way, shape, or form. He came out, it was slightly orange, but it was so blonde that you could barely see it. He just looked bald for approximately six months. I came out with blondish hair. My husband came out with blondish hair. What the heck is that doing on my baby's head? Like, I was just <laughs> absolutely shook. And so after I was, my husband just comes over busting out laughing, which I think just probably kicked me off more. And I'm like, my it's like it's her hair she can't have black hair so now we're, we're preoccupied on that they've got her intubated they bring her over and let us look at her take her up to the NICU my doctor is while we're you know doing all this she is just so busy trying to make sure that I'm not bleeding and she's not going to be the one responsible for killing me so she's doing everything she needs to do they take her upstairs um and Everything is good. The nurses, I had three nurses in there with me the entire like first four hours after I had her, just making sure. I mean, I have never had so many fundal massages in my life. I'm like, you guys realize that wasn't the problem, right? Like, okay. But, um, you know, and then you're waiting for news. You're waiting. So, you know, they do everything with you and then they set you up with the pump and you're just waiting. You can't, you can't go see your baby and that's. That was not, not natural, not, not great in any way, shape or form. And so, and we were finally able to go up and see her just after midnight and drop off the very little bit of colostrum. You know, I was finally able to pump and, um, she was intubated and, um, they had like, you know, the, the lamp on her and everything. And she's in the incubator and her, her little foot was about that yay big. And, um, I still didn't believe it. So I pulled her hand off and like, okay, that's legitimately hair. Okay. Um, and her face was all sorts of swollen still from being stuck. So she was really scary looking. Um, they explained everything and I just had the NICU tour like two days before. So I knew how most everything was working in there. They did a really good job of making you comfortable and they were private rooms too. So it was, you know, we were in there. They bring a pump in there. They set you up. You don't have to leave if you don't want to. There was no specific visiting hours. You could stay the night if you wanted to. So, um, and then she was in there for 98 days, <laughs> 98 days, an hour away from home. Um, 
And I drove there every single day. So for Liam, it was kind of just like I was going to work still. He went to the babysitter um, because they discharged me two days later. Leaving the hospital without a baby was the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. So um, there was no way, no possible way I was going anywhere other than back to that hospital every day. I took five months off work. Um, and it was one of, you know, those times where you're, you just, everybody wants to help, but they can't help. You know, what, what are you going to do? What are you, are you going to be able to take my baby, make her all better? And this little stinker is sweet as she is. Everything has to be Sophie speed. Everything has to be just for Sophie. So she had come home, um, on a feeding tube. Eventually, G-Tube, she made the first two years of her life awful, um, all because it would take too much effort to eat. And she still believes that it takes too much effort to eat, but she eats enough now to survive, which she refused to before. So, um, but she is a happy, healthy four-year-old, a tiny little one. She's only about 33 pounds now of tiny little tallness, um, but she... Um, definitely gave us all the, all the scare. Like, I, I always say like that, that was the end for me. I don't think I could survive another preemie. Like, again, if, you know, they, they told me, um, essentially when I went back to my doctor for my follow-up, if my, if that nurse practitioner had put me on bed rest and had had a cerclage because of my hip spreading and her being so low that whole time, I had a weakened cervix would know nobody did anything nobody listened so knowing better to advocate for myself and um also nothing against nurse practitioners but that wasn't the right option for a high-risk pregnancy so demanding to just get rescheduled to when he was available again um probably would have been better but that she was the deciding factor that there was going to be no more babies for you know a very very long time and then if there were, like I said, it would have been before she was out of diapers because potty training her, potty training the first one's easy. Potty training the second one's a nightmare. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. the truth. <laughs> yeah, I'm going through that now. <laughs> so how was, um, how was your mental health during all the um, NICU? That was, I mean, with Liam, there was no, I mean, again, postpartum was perfect. Healthy baby, healthy, healthy me um, with Sophie. Um, yeah, I mean, it was the, the the guilt of I'm leaving my my son every day. I'm spending too much time with her, and then walking out of that hospital every day for 98 days without a baby again was just traumatizing all over. So, um, mm -hmm. and I I had I pumped for her for 11 months, so it was just constantly you know i i couldn't it felt like i couldn't do anything you know so with her um i would say i think i made it approximately like maybe like five six days before i knew that i needed some type of help because i could not stop crying and they're like well you know like my husband god love him but sometimes he's just a man and I don't mean that towards all men, but just that typical stereotype man that does not have any type of emotional understanding. He's like, of course you're going to be emotional. Like, you just had a baby, you know? Like, this isn't emotional. I just had a baby. This is, like, I want to just grab our son and go live at the NICU. And that's not rational. It's not fair to him. But we're going to move in there and I'm not leaving and I can't take my baby. But if I do, like, you know, I can't take all the equipment and I know that's where she needs to be. But ir rationally, I can't figure it out. And they had their own um, NICU psychologist. She and I did not jive well at all. Um, so when I had gone for my doctor's appointment, she um, or he prescribed a meeting with um, this one that actually specialized in postpartum um, mental health care and that was great and um, I've worked with her for probably like six months and that I mean the NICU was on like floor number six um, just the number six up until 
um, like six months afterwards, just kicked in me into a tailspin and she got me out of all of that. And um, there was a lot of, I don't know, like mindset when pumping that, you know, like you're supposed to relax and release oxytocin and look at pictures of your baby and stuff. And pumping was just, again, like, I don't know, I, in the minute I hooked up to a pump, she was home for like four months at that point and it was still I was pumping in the NICU room and the alarms were going off and she stopped breathing and it was it was every single time so working with her was probably the only thing that kept me going um I don't think I would have ever harmed myself but I think at one point um I think my body would have just quit I think I I could have induced a heart attack on myself from stress and worry and, um, you know, all those, uh, what are they, the, I can't even remember what they're called anymore, which is probably a good thing. You know, the thoughts of like all terrible things happening. I couldn't even drive Liam um, mm-hmm. because I was like, that yeah, we're going to hit that. There's going to be an icy patch. We're going to go over a bridge and we're all going to die. And I couldn't, I couldn't drive yeah. with him for probably like three months um, when before I felt like super comfortable again. So I don't know. I, I was very proud that I was able to ask for help after her because I knew I needed it. And I don't think, yeah. um, I don't think my life would be the same if I didn't get it back then. And, um, yeah, I, I still see, um, a different therapist that she recommended because she's like, I think you've hit past, you know, all the, the postpartum things, but I don't, it's just the whole experience and really the whole experience with her is just afterwards with the NICU. Um, and with Liam, I don't, I could relive the, the moments after his birth forever anytime I close my eyes. So it's continually, I mean, he's seven and some change and working through all of that. So trying to come to terms of everything and get it to a point where it's, just normal to talk about it. It's, you know, and I think a big thing with, with Sophie, I think another healing thing is you hear about people having preemies all the time. There's pages you can join. How do I find someone? Oh, did you also have a fat baby that tore up inside your uterus too? Did, did that happen to you? Can we bond over that? No, no, you, you don't, you don't find that one. That one's not something that you can go to a support group and talk to someone with. So, you know, um, and then the ectopic, I think that one, I don't know if that's one that, I, that was, that's just something that happened. That was just another Tuesday. Like at that point in my life, it didn't feel crazy. Um, you know, um, it, it is what it is. And then at this point in my life, I'm, um, I've been having a lot of, I'm, it's not endometriosis, it's adenomyosis apparently from, all of my uterine happenings and it also usually occurs after surgeries. It's endometriosis that's inside of your uterus muscle, not on the inside of your uterus or the outside, but on the inside of the muscle. So, um, I just heard about this today, yeah. actually. Uh, I had never heard of it. Yeah. That was a made up thing that my doctor said. So, <laughs> um, uh-huh. but after dealing with that, without knowing what it was for like seven months. And um, I'm about three months away from finally having everything just ripped out. And I'm super excited. I don't think a lot of people can say that they're excited for a total hysterectomy at the age of 30, but I'm really excited. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, after, after Sophie, they were like, if you would like to be alive for your kids, I would really recommend not having any more kids. That sounds fair. I agree. I support this message. I will take you up on that. Mm -hmm. IUDs are great, but IUDs do not stop this feeling that you are in labor um, multiple times a week. So uh, I will. um, The the things you have to do as a woman that just wants to have your optional reproductive system ripped out. The things Mm -hmm. you have to do to get that. so we are a biopsy and um, two more weeks of pelvic floor therapy away from getting that finally approved through the insurance. 
So hoping sometime spring break-ish, I can celebrate spring break without a uterus. <laughs> so it's not doing me any good. I'm happy for yeah. you. Yeah, if it's going to help you, then I'm happy for you to have that yeah. option. Um, Yeah, I, I mean, just like the NICU story is like just you can prepare for birth. You can prepare for postpartum. You cannot prepare for NICU. You can't. I mean, I think I spent all, you know, however many days it was before I went into labor with her just on Facebook, joining like micro preemie groups and looking at what is my baby gonna look like and um i was told she was a fat baby she was two pounds 12 ounces and most babies her gestation were rocking right around like one pound like five ounces one pound eight ounces but i had gestational diabetes like apparently i say apparently because it it was i tested positive the day before she was born i'm like yeah i'm sitting in a bed doing absolutely nothing with no exercise, what do you want my body to do right now? So, but I, I just I had big babies. I would have more big babies, I'm sure. Um, I mean, when she was discharged from the NICU, she was 10 pounds, nine ounces. The fattest NICU baby you ever did see. Um, she, she, yeah. That's she had so rolls. Cool. She upon rolls. Aww. We could put her hair up in little piggy tails. I mean, she was a fat, cute baby. Everybody should say, why can't you bring her home? Love- because she refuses to eat to live. And they're like, well, then how is she so Aww. fat? Because we shove it down her throat. <laughs> I mean, the things that people didn't understand. And that was always worse. I mean, my husband's grandmother. We'll just bring her home and feed her. She'll eat when she's hungry. You don't think the doctors tried that? You don't think they tried that, Audrey? Yeah, she didn't eat for 12 and a half hours. You know how angry a baby is after they haven't eaten for 12 and a half hours? They're really freaking angry. Did that make her eat? Absolutely not. No, no. So you want me to bring her home and starve her and then go back to the hospital? That's what you want me to do? And then, yeah, we gave her a chance. She had the, the NG tube for Ted lunch because I just couldn't stand the thought of putting her through anything else. You know, my body did yeah. this to her. My body failed her. Now I'm going to have to make her have a surgery to get it directly into her stomach. That's not fair. She's going to have that scar the rest of her life mm-hmm. because my body couldn't support her. That didn't feel. And that's how I rationalized it back then. I know that's not right now, but. It was, you know, how I thought about it. But what, I mean, you've seen babies and when they're teething and what they do with their hands, a tube that is taped to their face all day, every day. There was one day and it was the day I finally called her doctor and said, we need to schedule that. She pulled it out 27 times, 27 times. Her face was literally raw. It was awful they oh. scream so much when you try to put it down their throat and i it was me and my husband that were trying to put it in i would have to leave work come home and put it back down just so we could feed her and um mm-hmm. you also can't get a 10 month old that is learning to walk even though she's uh, adjusted seven months old and trying to you know go everywhere she weighed maybe like 16 pounds it was she was the most hilarious looking child ever just because she was so little people were like how old is she don't ask it's a long story um so but um yeah i was like okay let's, let's get it in and i wish they would have forced us to go home on it some hospitals do it's just it would have been far better for my mental health not having to shove that thing down her not having to change it regularly i mean having her g tube was just, I mean, she only had it for 14 months. So, I mean, I don't know if it would have happened faster had she not constantly had something down. She had done, she did up until this July when she had her tonsils and stuff out, have scar tissue in her throat from having to have it placed for over the course of 10 months. So um, when they were in there with her tonsils, they scraped it out. And my goodness, she doesn't choke when she's eating anymore. I mean, I didn't know that we still had difficulties and stuff aside from getting her to sit still long enough to consume a meal but i mean she would get all caught up just choking on food and just seem normal but no it's from the scar tissue so 
they had sent it home with all of that and instead of going, she'll pick it up. A lot of babies are just stressed in the NICU. You know, she'll catch on for, for you know, yeah. 10 months. There was no catching on. She and she just didn't care. She was not a baby that, you know, you put a bottle in her mouth and it was no thank you. I, I don't want it. But she's still going to sit there and scream that she's hungry. So, um. I don't know, with her, it was like after she got that G-tube, it was almost like you had a normal baby for a second, except for, you know, every couple hours, mm-hmm. you got to, you know, we put her in like a, one of those little seats with like the um, tray in front of it so she couldn't move. Put her in that, strap her down and um, all the things that you learn in Facebook, like mom groups of other moms that have G-tube kids and it's like a cell phone holder. You take the cell phone holder, you strap it to the back of the chair, you put the little um, syringe in it because she was um, gravity fed. We never had to have a pump. She tolerated everything pretty well. And um, you sit there and you just sit behind her and you'd watch whatever was entertaining her. It's mostly usually Coco Melon. So JJ and I are not friends. But you sit there and just pour the milk in. Watch. Watch it go. Pour the milk in. <laughs> Spend 30 minutes doing that. And she was good. And it was always super nice, you know, when kids are sick and they don't want to eat or drink. I didn't have that issue. You know, you just grab the baby. She's still sleeping in bed. You open everything up. You put it on and you feed her. It's like, this is cool. I like this. I almost wish we could have kept it a little bit longer. But um, a very, you know, mobile two-year-old that liked to slide down on her belly down the stairs. She didn't care when it popped out, but I couldn't stick that thing back in anymore. No, thank you. So uh, it was time. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories and just, you know, how much you've gone through is a testament to who you are and your strength as a mom. So thank yeah, you so much. Thanks for having me. I don't know. Feels, feels good to share sometimes, you know, with other people that could benefit yeah. or at least understand. And we can, Add your connection on social media or however in our show notes, and that way people can reach out to okay. you if they'd like. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Thank Samantha. You guys. It was nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and found it insightful and beneficial. Remember, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. If you appreciate the content we bring you each week, Consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform or sharing the show with your friends and family. Your support helps us reach more people and continue creating valuable episodes. If you have any questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us on our website, www.goldenhourbirthpodcast or connect with us on social media. We value your feedback and want to make sure that we're delivering the content you want to hear. Before we sign off, we'd like to express our gratitude to our incredible guests who joined us today. We are honored that they trust us enough to be so open and vulnerable. We're grateful for their time and willingness to share their stories with us. If you're interested in taking the conversation further with us, join us on our Facebook group, The Golden Hour Birth Circle. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode, so be sure to tune in. Until then, stay golden and remember to take care of yourself. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Bye!